David Grove, and I would like to welcome you to this simulated video training program. The name of this particular intervention is called Tapestry, and it's an example of a client who comes in with a particular feeling of shame. What's important when working with shame, anger, or guilt is that so often the retelling of the story in fact helps to reinvest and perhaps to re-traumatize the client all over again. So an important feature of this intervention is to work in such a way that the client does not have to reveal the content about the particular experience. We begin first of all by establishing the client's epistemology, that is what would they like to have happen, and how do they know they've got what they've got? To help facilitate your understanding of these procedures, you'll find that there is the questions across the bottom of the screen, and then from time to time, a variety of different graphics helps to illustrate and to vivify the different metaphors that are being described. There are three important features to this intervention. The first one is to consider the moment in time that we are gathering this information from. To begin with, we start in the time period T minus one. T minus one is a moment of time in any given experience, just before the worst moment T. The purpose in healing the wounds around shame, guilt, or anger is to grow the experience up from T minus 1 through T into T plus 1 when it's all over. What we often find is that a client has frozen this moment of time, T minus 1, in which they relive and recapitulate the symptoms of their experience just before that very worst moment. You may be familiar with nightmares or dreams in which the experience is relived. For instance, a falling dream. And when you hit the ground, you wake up the moment just before you hit the ground. And that's a T minus one moment. Or a dream where you're being chased. Just as he goes to grab you, you wake up. So it's in that moment of time, T minus one, in which we find the most profound symptoms. We want to extinguish those symptoms so that they don't have to be felt again by growing those symptoms in the client up through T into T plus one when it's all over. We do this by establishing symptoms into metaphors using these questions. These are the questions we ask to develop metaphors from a feeling word, a thought word, or from a symptom. By asking a mixture of these kinds of questions, we help develop a semantic word into a metaphor. A metaphor is simply a container where information from an experience is carried across into something else. We know we have a metaphor when it's an object that we can actually draw. Once we have found metaphors that belong in the moment of time T minus one, our next task is to grow this information up. So we need to mature these metaphors so that they grow up from T minus one through into T plus one. And we do that by asking these questions. We mature the information from T minus one through T into T plus one. And these are the kinds of questions that help grow and develop the metaphors so that they're able to confess their strengths to the extent that they then can become useful, powerful, and healing metaphors instead of dysfunctional symptoms 
that the client originally presents with. Metaphors are foreign objects which have been imported into the body. So if you think about feelings that people describe such as I've got butterflies in my stomach, I'm all tied up in knots, or I go blank or foggy. Those are all features which belong outside but have yet imported inside. So part of the healing strategy is to provide a suitable environment in which the metaphors can be commissioned to go outside and to perform a healing and useful function. And it's this transformation from inside outside that we interrogate a metaphor until it confesses its strengths and that the dysfunctional symptoms are healing in the sense that the body of the client no longer has to hold these feelings inside. So we begin this intervention by asking where the symptoms are. And you'll notice it's a little bit like a mystery story. Because in working content-free, we have to mature the information because we do not know enough about what actually happened. So as we progress, see when it is that you may have discovered what the particular presenting symptom of this client was or what the nature of the event was. At the end of the intervention, we have some feedback in which the client will describe her particular experience. It's much easier to describe an experience after it has been healed than before. So what I would like to accomplish is um, I would like to um, get rid of the, the achy pain that I have in my, in my ankle and foot that spreads up into my leg. Um, and I've had the pain for about 15 or 20 years. And so when you've had the pain for about 15 or 20 years, and what would you like to have happen? I would like for the, I would like for the pain to go away. And when you have the pain, where do you have the pain? Um, I have the pain in my, um, in my ankle and in my foot on the inner side of my foot. And on the inner side of your foot. And when it's on the inner side of your foot, what's it like when it's on the inner side of your foot? It's like pressure. And pressure. And when it's like pressure, what kind of pressure? Um, it's like, it's like a balloon. It's like a balloon that's that's filled to capacity. And a balloon that's filled to capacity. And is there anything else about a balloon that's filled to capacity? Um, it feels like it's going to burst. And it feels like it's going to burst. And when a balloon feels like it's going to burst, is there anything else about a balloon that feels like it's going to burst? Um, no. And when a balloon feels like it's going to burst, what would a balloon that feels like it's going to burst like to have happen? It would like to have all of the air let out of it. And it would like to have all of the air let out of it. And what kind of air is that air? when it's in a balloon that wants to let all of the air out of it. It's, um, it's hot. And it's hot. And is there anything else about air that's hot? And it's dark. And it's hot and it's dark. And it's hot and it's dark. It's hot and it's dark like a hellhole. <laughs> and it's hot and it's dark like a hellhole. And is there anything else about hot and dark like a hellhole? You could speak.
spread? And it could spread. And when it's hot and dark, like a hell hole, what would hot and dark like to have happen? It would like to drain out. And hot and dark would like to drain out. And when hot and dark would like to drain out, it would like to drain out like what? Like lava. Like lava. And what kind of lava could that lava be? when it would like to drain out like lava? Uh, it's, um, it's sluggish and it has, it has hard things in it. And it's sluggish and it has hard things. And when it's sluggish and has hard things, what kind of hard things could sure. those Sharp, hard things. And sharp, hard things. And sharp like what? Sharp like, um... Sharp like a needle. And sharp like a needle. And when it's sharp like a needle, what kind of needle could that needle be when it's sharp like a needle? dark needle. And a dark needle. And a dark needle. And when it's sharp, like a dark needle, is there anything else about that dark needle? It just could hurt. It could hurt. It could, it could do a lot of damage. And a dark needle could do a lot of damage. And is there anything else about a dark needle that could do a lot of damage? It could tear flesh. And a dark needle could tear flesh. And what flesh would a dark needle like to tear? when a dark needle would like to tear flesh. It could, it could tear flesh on, on the outside and the inside. And a dark needle would, could tear flesh on the inside and on the outside. And would a dark needle like to tear flesh on the inside or on the outside first? On the outside. And on the outside. And does a dark needle know where it would like to tear flesh? On the outside first. On the arms. And on the arms. And whereabouts on the arms would a dark needle like to tear flesh? By the elbow. And by the elbow. And which elbow? Could a dark needle like to tear flesh first? On the left. On the left elbow. And can a dark needle begin to tear flesh on the left elbow? Yes. And as a dark needle tears flesh, on the left elbow, what happens next as a dark needle tears flesh on a left elbow? It likes it. And it likes it. And as a dark needle tears flesh, on a left elbow and likes it. What does a dark needle want to do next? 
It wants to stop. And it wants to stop. And when a dark needle stops and it likes to tear flesh on a left elbow, what would a dark needle like to do next? It would like to be broken. It would like to be broken. And how can a dark needle be broken? It could be bent. And it could be bent. And a dark needle could be bent like what? Like a, like a bent needle. Like a bent needle. And what kind of bent needle could that bent needle be? Like a sewing needle. And like a sewing needle. And a bent needle like a sewing needle. And where could a sewing needle like to go? And what would a sewing needle like to do when it's bent? It would like to, it would like to, it would like to heal the hurts. And it would like to heal the hurts. And which hurt? In the ankle. In the ankle. And can a sewing needle be interested in going to an ankle that yes. hurts. Yes. And what would a sewing needle do to an ankle that hurts? It could pop the balloon inside the ankle. And whereabouts on a balloon would a sewing needle like to pop? Um, right in the middle of it. And right in the middle. And can a sewing needle pop a balloon right in the middle? Yes. And as a sewing needle pops a balloon right in the middle, what happens next? Black comes out. And black comes out. And black comes out like what? Like sludge. Like sludge. And what kind of sludge is that sludge? Disgusting. And disgusting sludge. And where would disgusting sludge like to go? Hmm. It would like to just, it would like to go into the earth. And as disgusting sludge goes into the earth, what happens when disgusting sludge goes into the earth? It works itself into the soil. And as it works itself into the soil, what happens to disgusting sludge? It, it, it mixes with the good earth. And it mixes with the good earth. And it mixes with the good earth like what? Like fertilizer. Like fertilizer. And what happens when the good earth is mixed with fertilizer. It nourishes the soil. And it nourishes the soil. And does the soil like to be nourished? Yes. With fertilizer. And when soil is nourished with fertilizer, what happens to soil nourished? It, it attracts, um, it attracts seeds. And it attracts seeds. And what kind of seeds does it attract? Pine cones. And pine cones. And what happens when pine cones go to good earth nourished? They sprout. And they sprout like what? Like like seedlings they sprout and they sprout like seedlings and when seedlings sprout what happens next they put out shoots and they open 
They open. And shoots open. And shoots open like what? Like, like hands. And shoots open like hands. And what kind of hands could those hands be? Hands um, open and relaxed. And hands open and relaxed. And when hands are open and relaxed, and wood, a curved sewing needle, be interested in going to hands that are open and relaxed. Yes. And what could hands that are open and relaxed do with a needle that was good. Hands could straighten the needle. And hands could straighten the needle. And could those hands straighten a needle? Yeah. And as those hands straighten a needle, what would those hands like to do with a needle? Create. And create. And what would those hands like to create? Beauty. And beauty. And what would be the first beauty that they'd like to create? A tapestry. And a tapestry. And what kind of tapestry could a needle and those hands create? A multicolored. A multicolored. Tapestry. A multicolored tapestry. And could a balloon that had been in a foot be interested in going to a multicolored tapestry? Yes. And what would a multicolored tapestry do to a balloon? It would, it would invite it in. And as it invites it in, what happens to a balloon that's invited in. It is incorporated into the tapestry. And incorporated like what? Like, like silk. Like silk. And what kind of silk? Mm, silken strands. And silken strands like what? Like my hair. And silken strands like your hair. And does a tapestry like silken strands? Yes. Like your hair. And what does a tapestry do to silken strands? Like your hair. It weaves, it weaves in, it weaves, weaves the strands into itself. And it weaves the strand into itself. And as it weaves the strands into itself, And it weaves the strands into itself. And it's been a long time since those strands have been weaved into itself. And a tapestry weaves those strands into itself. And let a tapestry take all the time that it needs to weave those strands into itself. And hands that are open and relaxed and a sewing needle that's straight and a tapestry and take all the time that a tapestry needs to weave silken hair into itself. And what can happen? The tapestry, um, um, it can, it can wrap around me. And the tapestry 
can wrap around you and the tapestry can wrap around you. And would a tapestry be interested in wrapping around a left arm that's flesh had been torn? And as a tapestry wraps around a left arm whose flesh had been torn, and hands that are open and relaxed, and a soul needle. And what happens when a tapestry wraps around a left arm? It makes it makes the arm it makes the arm feel okay. And it makes the arm feel okay. And the tapestry makes an arm feel okay. And it's been a long, long time since that arm feel okay. And as a tapestry wraps around a left arm and makes it feel okay, could the tapestry be interested in wrapping around around a foot like what? Like like a stocking. And like a stocking. And what kind of stocking could that stocking be? Um, an orthopedic support stocking. <laughs> no. An, an interesting stocking like that. <laughs> Uh, that beautiful tapestry. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful orthopedic And it's a stocking. beautiful <laughs> orthopedic stocking. And does a <clears throat> foot like a beautiful orthopedic stocking. Yes. And it's much better to have an orthopedic stocking that's beautiful than to have a balloon filled with slush. Does a foot like that? Yes, a foot loves that. And a foot loves that. And a foot loves that. And when a foot loves that, and what would a foot like to do when a foot loves that? It would like to dance. And a foot would like to dance. And if a foot would like to dance, and a foot had been wrapped with an orthopedic stocking that was beautiful, would a foot be interested in tap dancing? <laughs> sure. And a foot could tap dance <laughs> with a tapestry like that. And would a foot like to dance? Any other kind of dance? Ballet. And ballet. And could a foot ballet? Yes. And a foot can ballet. And would a foot like to do anything else? No. And a foot likes to dance. And as a foot likes to dance, and would a foot like to do anything else after it's danced? Show off. And show <laughs> off. And it's been a long time <laughs> since that foot could show off. can show off and what would an arm like a left arm like to do when a foot shows off? Oh, just wave around. And can a 
left arm wave around while a foot shows off. Yeah. And the left arm can wave around and a foot can show off. A beautiful tapestry can wrap around the foot like an orthopedic stocking and the foot can dance and show off and the left arm can wave around. And do you like that? Yes. And you like that. And would you like anything else when you like that? Well, I'd like to have everything dancing and moving. And you'd like to have everything dancing and moving. And what's the first? Everything that would like to dance and move. My right side. And your right side. And when your left arm waves, can your right side move? Yes. And as your right side moves and your foot dances, what part of you would like to move next? Just my whole body. And can your whole body move? Yes. And can your whole body dance? Yes. And can your whole body wave? Yes. And does your whole body like that? Yes. And your whole body likes that? And do you need anything else? No. When your whole body likes that. And you like that. And you like that. And it's been a long time since your whole body could move and dance. Good. 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 I'm good dancing. <laughs> I've got two lips. <laughs> um, okay, this this whole thing uh, started for me with the foot. Um, about 20 years ago, uh, when I was I was a heroin addict, and um, I OD'd one time, and um, I OD'd more than one time. And one of the times when I did, um, someone, in an attempt to revive me, put me in a bathtub and put my foot up underneath the faucet and turned on hot water instead of cold, and consequently burned my foot. Um, severely and um, and so I've had this scar all that time and it um, ever since then um, I've had a lot of achy pain in that leg and I've had problems with varicose veins in that leg um, and um, so there's a lot of shame there's a lot of shame held in that scar and then it just it would like it was like spreading up my leg and so I, I attempted to have surgery um, to take care of the veins, thinking that the scar would go away. And of course what happened was more scars were created. So uh, it's only been in the past year that I have hooked up um, um, being shamed by that and an inability to forgive myself for that with that scar. And I have been working on, um, every time I feel the ache, I've been working on forgiveness, trying to forgive myself for this. And I think in my head I have done it, but um, emotionally, on a real deep level, I'm not sure that I, I was getting very far with it. So I feel like, like this has at least helped things to move um, inside. 
um, during the uh, during the process, um, uh, I was real nervous, and I felt like I really felt like nothing was happening. I felt like um, I did, I just felt like I was an adult answering questions. So it surprised me when when certain things came up. Um, I was surprised when the arm came up because I had never I never associated the um, scars on my arm with the scars on my leg. Um, and the needle, when the needle came up, um, it surprised me. I think I think I couldn't say that I, I liked the needle in my arm. The needle liked being in my arm. I didn't like it, but the needle liked being in my arm. And when the needle didn't want to be in my arm anymore, um, I liked that. Um, it surprised me that the needle turned into a sewing needle. Um, and I liked it when, when the needle went into the balloon and sludge came out, because I had never... The balloon for me, the balloon has been an image that I've had before in my foot, but the balloon before was always filled with air, with clear air. I mean, I'd never envisioned sludge in there. And sludge is kind of like congealed blood, which is kind of like what happens down in there with the, the blood not circulating and it gets thicker down there. At least that's the way it feels. Um, when, the, when the sludge went into the ground and then the seeds went into the ground and the hands came up, I thought the hands were going to I thought the hands were just going to be open to um, open to sunlight and, and going to feel warmth and things like that. And so when when you brought the needle into my hand, it was it was a delight. I mean, it was like it, something I hadn't thought of doing, um, but it really I liked the way it kind of um, it allowed me to to pull in. It wasn't only, you know, it wasn't that good things were coming into me. It was that I was able to take the, the bad that had happened and put it into a beautiful form. And when, when the form became a tapestry, I thought the tapestry was going to encompass me and be like a piece of armor. And what happened was the tapestry... Um, the tapestry wrapped around my arm and the tapestry wrapped around my leg and instead of instead of enfolding it and um, being like a piece of armor it actually freed them up so that they could move and um, and not be protected I mean and, and be be free to express themselves um, let's see The, the dancing the dancing was also a surprise for me. I was I, I, when I was young, I wanted to be a ballerina and, um, and I still have fantasies about about being a ballerina. Um, and uh, I was just um, my father told me I couldn't because it wasn't it wasn't something that wasn't a way that you could earn a living, so there's no point in being a ballerina. And so I kind of gave that up. And the, the tapestry part, it, I have always wanted to be a weaver. I, I've not pursued it, but it's something that... Um, dream weaving. <laughs> I don't know, I've just always thought that that is something that I would want to do. Um, since the interview has ended, um, I have felt in my foot, I f it feels warm and tingly. The, the whole foot does, the ankle does, and it feels, um, I can feel something like moving in there um, on the inside. Um, it feels like the skin from that scar that has always been so tight and so restrictive, um, it feels like that skin is, um, at least 
can. He has the possibility of, of loosening up. Um, I've also felt kind of shaky since it's been over. Um, okay, what difference do you think it will make? I think I have really, really been ashamed of this leg. I mean, it's like I don't like to, I don't like to expose it at all. In the summertime, I love the summertime, but I, I like to be able to cover up this foot. And I think the tapestry is, uh, is something that I can use to, um, to make it beautiful and to make it, to make it acceptable. And I think that, I don't know, I just, I think it's going <laughs> to, I think it's going to be looser. And I think I'm just going to feel, I'm going to feel good about it. Um, I think it's, it's, I still think it's a start, but I think that it's, it's just, it's helped to shake things up underneath. So. Well, I guess you'll find out, won't you? Yeah. It's nice to have some behavior ways to find out just what will happen and what difference it'll make. And to enjoy a tapestry. Since I had the session with David um, four months ago, I've noticed a few changes. One of them is that um, wh I used to think about my left foot, and I would try and imagine it being just like my right foot. Um, I would try and imagine it being um, without any scars, and there would be no distended veins on that, um, that foot. Um, it would be just, you know, just perfect, just like my right foot. And since I went through the session, I, I have started viewing my foot differently. And when I look down at it now, um, I, you know, when I see the, the veins that are larger on that foot, um, you know, I see them as more, I don't know, just uh, a thing of beauty rather than something that needs to be hidden or something that I need to be ashamed of. And the scar is, um, is also, it, it's like, it, it makes it more interesting. And um, so I no longer hate what, you know, the, the differences between my feet. And I'm no longer trying to make um, this part of myself the same as another part of myself. I'm just kind of accepting what, what it is and even um, enjoying it. Um, I also, I've noticed that I'm buying shoes differently now. I'm buying shoes that expose my feet more and I don't know if, if you know, remember from the, the tape, but I had on um, a pair of tennis shoes and then socks that covered my ankle and my foot. And now I'm, um, I've worn shoes without socks and I wear um, sandals and everything else that really show my foot. And, and that feels really nice, having it out in the open. Um, I've also started painting. Um, I, I think I've always um, had an attraction for painting and drawing and, and dancing and, and things like that, but I've never really allowed myself to do any of those things. Um, and I've just, I've just had this desire to have color in my life, and so I went down to the local art store and bought myself a, a nice set of um, watercolors, and they're just beautiful colors, and I'm having just a lot of fun playing around with, with painting. And I think I have in mind that I would eventually like to paint a picture of um, what I was imaging at the very end of our session. Um, one thing I, I liked about the, um, the session was that I felt like I didn't... Wh when, I, when I started out, I really had... You know, all I intended to talk about was my, my foot and that I had an ache in my foot. And I had no intention at all of talking about a needle or about um, an addiction that I had. Um, and it was, uh, it was just kind of neat the way that um, my, my psyche just kind of took over and said, listen, in order to heal this part of you, in order to get rid of this ache, you need to attend to these other things. And, you know, it was like nobody knew where it was going and that's just the way it ended up. And, um, you know, and it took... It took, uh, I've always liked my arms. I think my arms are strong. And, and, um, and it took this, 
part of myself that I like, my arm, that had a needle in it, and it took it down to the, the foot that I didn't like and incorporated those two. And um, uh, it was just nice the way it, it allowed the needle to heal that, that part of myself. Um, I also have, um, in the past couple of months, really been enjoying where I'm living. I've lived in this pati- particular spot for 10 years, and, um, and it's, a, it's a beautiful part of the world, and a lot of people would love to live there, but I've never really wanted to be there. Um, I've never been able to appreciate the beauty of, of the spot. Um, and it just seems like in this past year, um, I've been able to go back to places where I thought I would rather be and um, have some healings occur. And certainly when I went to this, this session, um, that's what happened for me. I, it, was, it, it allowed me to kind of let go of these longings that I had for other places and um, has allowed me to really uh, enjoy and appreciate where I am right now. The following excerpts are from the simulated video training program, Metaphors to Heal By. Tape 1 takes you through a didactic and theoretical framework of how to make sense of metaphors that your clients may give you. Tapes 2, 3, and 4 are a series of full-length interventions in which you have the script along the bottom and the client's feedback at the end. These are designed to facilitate you in asking the right questions to the metaphors. The case study, Boiling Pot, is an example of the dissociation which occurs in very severe physical and sexual abuse. Um, I'm an incest victim. Um, I've been working in therapy for over 10 years with the issues. I come from a family that my father's an alcoholic. Uh, My mother is mentally ill. The abuse started when I was very young, um, infant, up until the time I was 18 and I left home. I um, was raped many times by my father and my oldest brother. Uh, My older sister and brother, and I have a younger brother and a sister, and they both, all of them choose not to remember anything. And where is the part of the little girl who wants to leave? In her head. And whereabouts in her head? In her brain. And in her brain, and when there's a part of the little girl who wants to leave, and it's in her brain, does it have a shape or a size when it's in her brain? No, it just feels angry. And it feels angry. And when it feels angry, what's it like when it feels angry? like a fire. And it's like a fire. And what kind of fire is that fire? It's like a pot boiling. And it's like a pot boiling. Feels clean. And she feels clean. And as she feels clean and a waterfall falls, what would a waterfall like to do next? just keeps running and just makes a little girl happy and is she like a waterfall running yes and that's quite different to have a waterfall running cool and clear than to have to have a pot boiling yes and to have to have a tear that wants to fall but can't. And it's quite different to have a waterfall that's running. Mm. And a little girl 
can be in a waterfall that's running. And it's been a long time since she's known about running because her feet were glued. Mm -hmm. And what would she like to do when a waterfall keeps running? Just play in it. And can she play? Mm -hmm. The case study, Grape Rape, provides an example of the amnesia that a client has for a rape experience. And as we uncover this experience, we discover that there's another rape at the end of it. And burn him. And can a lightning burn him? And whereabouts would lightning like to burn him? And what part of him would lightning like to burn first? His hands. His hands. <laughs> and would lightning like to burn which hand or both hands? Lightning would like to burn that hand. And can lightning burn that hand? Mm. And as lightning burns that hand, what happens next? Would lightning like to burn his face? <laughs> and what part of his face would lightning like to burn? face all gone and can lightning burn hands. Yes. And lightning's fast. Yes. And what would lightning like to burn next when it burns hands and all gone face? The case study, Daddy's Special Date, chronicles a child's experience as she heals the incest that occurred with her father when he took her out for drives in the country. And you stop and get out of the car. And what happens next when you stop and get out of the car? Oh, there's, you know, it's, it's, um, it's like in the country. And then what happens when it's like in the country? There's tall grass and and um, you know sort of walking and and um, we just sort of um, there and and I thought we were going to play. Another videotape is available separately and it's called Jesse, the First Flowers of Spring. This tape is in a documentary style and chronicles the brave journey of a child's healing from sexual abuse. The particular client is a therapist and she looks back nine months after the intervention and describes what was going on inside her experience during the process. In the intervening time, she gathered together photographs and film taken in 1940 of the 
perpetrator and her together. She also documents her experience with vivid drawings. I think that when we're watching this, I'd like people to note that since I'm grieving, the experience is over. And I'm no longer the five-year-old reliving the experience. I'm shifting at different ages, and I'm remembering the experience that I've lost. I want him back in my life, but he's dead. I uh, want him back in your life, but he's dead. <coughs> it's not right, but I loved him all the ways a woman loves a man. And you loved him all the ways a woman loves a man. Couldn't take my eyes off of him. And you I could. wanted to stay with him. My heart was his. My body was his. I can see how if a person was looking out the kitchen window, you couldn't see anything because that's what people do when they're making love. They lie down between the rows and the garden so nobody can see them from the house. That's and it's furtive. They take off your clothes and you make love. And it's... And now I see myself in my own home now, standing next to my bed. I've got a double bed with black railings and it's empty. And I've got the, the shawl around me with the red roses. And there's no one to be in my bed. And there's no I will never love him the way I couldn't even grow up to love. And you? We were separated and then he died. There's no one to be in your bed, <laughs> and you can never love anyone like you loved him, and you loved him like a woman loves, with your whole heart and your whole body, and you loved him between the rows of the peas, and you loved him furtively. And you loved him in the garden by the lake. And you can't see from out of the kitchen window. And you loved him. And you had nobody to love in your big bed with the railing. And you can love no one like you loved him. I've never had flowers to give to a man, so I would have to find flowers that a man would take. The first flowers that come up are crocus, and that's not a right flower to give up a man. And the first but flower is not a right flower. You don't give the first flowers of springtime to a man. You do not. You do not. It is not right. 